Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'm the co-director of Storage X Initiative. And together with my co-director, Professor Yi Tui from the Material Science Engineering Department, we're delighted to bring to you another exciting panel discussion. So today is a very special event. Those of you who have participated in some of these in the past know that we occasionally have focused discussions where we discuss the option of X. So this is the storage X, X. And today's discussion is going to be focused on long duration storage. We already had a similar discussion at the end of last year where we heard from academics and the national labs, specifically from George Crabtree and Mike Aziz on the chemistry side of long duration storage. Today, we're delighted to assemble a very exciting panel from three leading companies pioneering innovations in this area. So we're gonna to hear today from leaders at Form Energy, Energy Vault, and Intervenue. Ian e and I are truly delighted to host this panel and really to offer a perspective that is comprehensive and in depth We'll hear about the importance of understanding the electricity grid and the value of energy storage. We're going to hear about mechanical energy storage as an avenue for long duration storage. And then we're going to hear exciting, very durable, low maintenance chemistry for storage as well. So without further delay, I'm extremely delighted to introduce our first speaker, who's gonna kick us off. So Dr. Marco Varrera is from Form Energy, where he directs um, its uh, grid modeling effort. And Marco has a distinguished um, career in the area of energy storage and analysis. Uh, holding senior positions at 24M and IHI. And he also has a PhD from MIT's Nuclear and Engineering Department. And he has been with uh, FORM uh, from the very start as his co-founder. So Marco, we're very delighted to hear from you and for you to set the scene for our discussion today. Marco, go right ahead. Thank you, uh, Will, and uh, Yi, and uh, the rest of the team, and uh, I'm really honored to be part of this panel um, and really kind of tee up this important discussion around this excited topic. And uh, yeah, uh, just uh, be kudos for this initiative. You guys are pulling together, super exciting, and really we need this kind of um, uh, you know, forum to uh, propel the industry forward. So uh, in correctly, well, like you said, in today's discussion, I'm gonna try to give an overview of the importance of modeling tools for future grids to understand the needs and plan for and procure for future grids. And also I'm gonna try to cast a light on the cost of not using the right tools and the right approaches. Um, that's very important because as we drive towards deep decarbonization on it as soon as possible, honestly, timeline, um, making the right decisions, using the right tools uh, makes the difference between supporting and deploying the right technologies and getting to the goal or not. So that's where I'm going to be focusing the conversation today. Now, uh, let me start with some acknowledgements. Uh, the work that I'm going to be presenting today uh, is not uh, only my work, uh, and it is not primarily my work, it's the work of my team. Um, and I'm really uh, proud to be working with a fantastic team at Form Energy. Um, and uh, in particular, I want to thank uh, Scott Berger, um, our analytics lead really led the majority of the analysis that uh, I'm going to be presenting today. So uh, just a, I'm going to put a sort of a marketing plug in here. Um, uh, the presentation today will now focus on Form Energy proprietary technology. Uh, but of course, we are developing some very exciting innovation in the space. 
um, something that we think will bring to market um, a, a truly disruptive, low-cost, multi-day electrical storage solution, a missing piece in a 100% uh, decarbonized world. Uh, having a battery that essentially unlocks multiple days of electrical storage capability cost effectively transforms completely uh, the picture and in the land of possibilities essentially. And so um, please have a look at our career page. We're growing fast and uh, we, uh, we welcome uh, super talented and ambitious professionals to join our team. All right, let's set the stage. Um, the, the electricity world is changing quickly. Um, as you can see, this is just looking at the United States and the states that have adopted or proposed 100% uh, goals on a timeline that varies more or less in the range 2040 through 2050, which in the world of electricity is very, very soon. We're talking 20 years one cycle of infrastructure deployment down the road, and we had these important goals, um, which are not um, arbitrary. They're essential to meet our uh, climate change mitigation targets. What does it mean in terms of actually how many people are affected by these policies? Um, well, uh, more than 35, more than a third uh, um, Americans are affected by uh, these policies and the up and coming policies will affect an additional 20%. So we're talking about 50% of the American population affected by these policies. We're talking about a huge user base. And we're starting to see this, of course. We have seen this for a few years now and it's super exciting, right? The push to deploy more renewables and to an extent now more recently short duration storage, if you wish, is exciting. We're aiming in the right direction. But this means also we are at the really cusp of an energy transition. And we can already start seeing some of the problems arising. Deep renewables typically drive higher volatility and risk in energy markets. Um, here is an example of a very busy slide. Um, I'll try to give you the gist of it. Essentially, if you look at 2018 in uh, the Southwest Power Pool, which is one of the uh, uh, power markets in the United States with the largest amount of wind, and you look at the distribution of prices, of energy prices across seasons and through the full range of hours of the season, and then you look specifically at the hours where uh, there is more renewable penetration, well, those hours exhibit much higher volatility and depressed pricing. Now, volatility is equivalent to risk because essentially the potential revenues of incremental renewable generation are a risk and that drives the cost of financing and deploying additional renewable generation. So problem number one, increasing renewables, increasing intermittency, increasing market volatility, increasing risk, reduced incentive to deploy additional renewables. Problem number two, when we overlay transmission constraints, and we all know how difficult it is to build new transmission from renewables uh, rich areas to low pockets, um, you start seeing congestion. You start seeing too much renewable being generated upstream of a bottleneck. And you can see again in this busy and very analytical slide, the correlation of wind generation and congestion. Congestion depresses the value of electricity we're pushing into the grid, pushes back on new renewable integration. So in a high renewable world, what we expect is higher volatility and potentially depressed pricing, which is further exacerbated by transmission constraints. It doesn't stop at that. So here is a case study, for example, again, going back to a very analytical tool, which is uh, representing the distribution of prices. If you look back at the Southwest Power Pool, which is the area that we're using for this analysis, and you look at the distribution of prices across the market in blue, or the distribution of prices for a specific wind farm 
in orange, you see how bad those prices are at the source of renewable generation. They're downshifted, they're depressed, and they're much more volatile. Uh, the renewable revolution, in other words, is cannibalizing itself. There is also another big problem, and that is um, reliability. So, so far, we've been looking at the problem from a standpoint of, say, market economics. Uh, in other words, uh, the kind of problems that renewables are bringing to uh, power grids from the standpoint of the value of that electricity and the risk of the revenues of renewable generators. But really, uh, we need to consider also a reli the reliability aspect. So um, can we run a grid um, mostly on renewables? And what kind of reliability problems can we expect in a mostly renewable grid? Uh, well, uh, influential studies uh, that are starting to look at grids with large amounts of renewable generation point to the multi-day reliability problem. In other words, when you're running a grid primarily on renewables and you're retiring um, the majority of fossil fuel assets, dispatchable assets, reliable assets, now you're much more exposed to weather events. And some of those weather events extends extend through multiple hours and multiple days. So what are we gonna do about that? Are we gonna uh, shed customer load? Are we gonna uh, ask people to not use electricity for several hours or several days in a row? The cost of those events uh, can be staggering from a societal standpoint. So we need to start also accounting for different types of reliability conditions and plan and procure for it. That's where long duration storage comes in, right? Um, and in fact, some of these, uh, some of the early influential studies that are looking at futures with large amounts of renewable generation, for example, they recently released a study by the California uh, Energy Storage Association, um, show that California could use tens of gigawatts, uh, 55 gigawatts of long duration storage uh, in a deep decarbonized uh, scenario. Now, that's a huge amount. Uh, the California peak load is around 60 gigawatts. We need about as much in long duration storage. Uh, then long duration storage is still broadly qualified in the context of the study as anything north of eight hours, I, I believe. Uh, so we need to become also a bit more precise of different classes and different categories of long duration storage and their corresponding applications. But yet, this is a huge number and something that we need to start thinking seriously about now because we won't build 55 gigawatts overnight. It'll take time to de-risk the technologies and deploy the technologies towards the energy needs. So the question is, do we have the right tools to understand what we need uh, and procure uh, for long duration storage in future grids? And this is where I think my presentations will, will get really nerdy and really in the weeds, but it's important. I'll try to keep it a high level. I'll try to bring forward the main um, points, but it's important that we understand that these tools and these modeling practices affect profoundly how the grid evolves and whether we steer the ship in the right direction or not. So grid planning models and processes affect everything. Affect, for example, the way uh, federal and state ag agencies allocate incentives or create markets. It affects the way regulators think about cost effectiveness of different portfolios. It affects the way utilities procure resources. It affects pretty much everything. And so it's important that we look at the right, to, we use the right tools and the right practices. There are several classes of tools. And uh, today in particular, I'm gonna be speaking to capacity expansion models. They're the tools by which essentially these entities design and plan um, and procure uh, for future grids. And there are different classes of these tools. There are open source tools uh, that everybody can sort of access and review and operate, assuming the right level of proficiency. 
and then there are um, proprietary tools and there are of course commercial tools by the big vendors in the space. Now let's focus for a second on the typical approach to capacity expansion, which is again, the way we plan for and procure for future grids. Um, these are complex tools. These tools try to model future scenarios on the grid. Uh, they try to model consumption of electricity, uh, renewable generation, uh, portfolios of various types of assets, in some cases, transmission constraints, et cetera, et cetera. And they try to answer the question, what is the cost minimizing portfolio and operation that uh, essentially leads to reliable supply of electricity for uh, uh, electrical uh, customers, electrical consumers, for society in general. Um, as you may imagine, uh, they deploy different types of optimization frameworks, uh, the most advanced of which are mixed integer linear programs. Um, and uh, because sometimes the size of these problems uh, is very large, uh, they must take some compromises. And one of the typical compromises is to select only, so only a small time uh, slivers out of a full year to uh, then model the optimal portfolios based on the reduced uh, time sample. And then to, uh, in some cases, stress test those portfolios against a variety of possible different conditions, weather conditions, load conditions, fuel cost conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And that's in uh, the spirit of sort of testing the robustness of the selection against a variety of possible features. So let's, let's remember these two important characteristics of current approach. Uh, time reduction is one, or sampling, if you wish. And the other one is uh, the two-step approach of first designing a portfolio and then stress testing the portfolio. And so let's run it to ground. And what we did at Form Energy, and um, this is also public information um, that is available uh, in a utility dive article that Scott and myself recently co-authored with E3, um, a, a very valued partner of ours, as well as in a white paper that you can download from our website. So let's test, test these two typical approaches that are industry standard to capacity expansion uh, against former. Former is former energy software for the optimal planning of future grids. We're going to stress test first the cost and consequences of time reduction, and then we're going to stress test the cost and consequence of the two-step approach, portfolio design and stress testing. Um, and I want to say, in this case, we're going to stress test the stress test um, uh, those approach. We're going to um, we're going to study um, those two approaches, uh, considering a reference case of the regional um, energy deployment system uh, by the National Renewable Energy Lab, in particular, their time sampling approach. Um, this is not to cast a negative light on that tool. There is a spectacular tool with um, a scope that is geographically vast and temporally extended. Uh, it's a great tool, uh, but what we wanna do here is to look specifically at the cost of some simplifications and the cost that that may have in terms of planning future grids. So first of all, uh, let's look at the value of uh, not doing uh, time sampling, uh, of looking at the full chronology of a year in a grid that runs primarily on renewables. Um, so intuitively, you know, we may agree that if um, uh, we run a grid primarily on renewable electricity, um, we must capture the full chronology of the uh, renewable output. And if we don't do that, we're gonna miss some of the important dynamics of their resource. Um, it was okay to perhaps use a uh, time sampling approach 
uh, or a time reduction approach, if you wish, in a world that was running primarily on fossil fuels, um, because those resources were entirely dispatchable. Uh, but that may not be the case anymore in a world that runs primarily on renewable electricity. And uh, in this case, the metric that we're looking at is the levelized cost of energy. Um, this is data from the analysis of a, um, an anonymized but real utility portfolio, where we looked at a utility portfolio. Uh, we looked at their goals of increasingly decarbonizing and incorporate um, incremental amounts of renewable electricity. And we did the capacity expansion exercise in one case over the full year, looking at the full um, 8760 um, of renewable generation or uh, time slices. And so you can see that if you do, uh, if, you, if you design that portfolio based on a full year, the 8760 case, you arrive to a certain cost of supplying electricity. And here there is a range depending on various cost uh, assumptions. So between 38 and $41 a megawatt hour uh, electricity to the, uh, to the customers. Um, if you use uh, time samples, um, according to the methodology uh, in the Unreal uh, Reads uh, uh, tool, uh, you arrive to a different cost, which is lower, 29 to $33 a megawatt hour. However, if you take the portfolio that you've designed with a time reduction technique and you run it against a realistic 8760, so a full year hourly resolution scenario or weather data, you end up with a higher cost. And that is because number one, you're running more often fossil fuel generation that you were uh, originally designing for. And number two, occasionally, you may have not procured the right resources and you may incur in lo loss of load, which is of course expensive. So here is an example where clearly there is an important benefit and a, um, you know, there are financial consequences in using a full 8760 approach or a time reduced approach. Secondly, um, what about the, the kind of portfolio that you end up with? And this is extremely important and relevant for new technologies like long duration storage. Well, also, uh, this should be intuitive. If you look at the, uh, a year, uh, if, you, if you reduce the, uh, the scope of the year um, to just select representative days, and so you use the time reduction technique, um, well, you end up essentially not capturing the value of long duration storage because you lose the chronology of the renewable resource from day to day and use the possibility of really uh, leveraging the benefit of long duration storage or multi-day storage. And so here is an example where if you do the analysis on a full 8760, you end up with a portfolio that includes large amounts of long duration storage, and that is lower in cost than if you were designing the same portfolio just on a uh, reduced time base. Um, so another very important takeaway uh, is that if we don't use the right methodology to model future grids and plan for future grids, we end up not deploying the right resources, particularly long duration storage. And finally, you know, we spoke about this before. If you do an analysis and you plan a portfolio uh, based on only select uh, days, you may end up not uh, accounting for multi-day reliability events. So you may have to incur loss of load Whereas if you analyze the full, uh, the full time, the full year with the right resolution, um, you may have deployed long duration storage and essentially carried through multi-day uh, renewable events or weather events uh, reliably and without loss of load for consumers. Um, so let's tackle briefly the second point that I made, which was about uh, essentially uh, the cost of a two-step approach, designing a portfolio and then stress testing it against a variety of scenarios versus co-optimizing a portfolio 
considering from the onset the full spectrum of possible scenarios. Um, you can see here, uh, again, a business I apologize. And, and yes, this content is very technical, um, consequential, but very technical. Uh, you can see on the right here uh, a number of scenarios. Um, the first one represents a co-optimized portfolio. So in this case, the portfolio resources for this utility has been designed across a variety of possible futures and possible scenarios, different weather events, weather years, cost of resources, et cetera, et cetera. So the optimization problem is bigger, but again, uh, the solution is much more cost effective. Why? Because essentially a portfolio um, designed with a co-optimized approach achieves the lowest levelized cost of electricity of portfolios that have been designed essentially with only one specific scenario in mind and then oversized or uh, complemented to essentially be robust against a variety of scenarios. You can see that uh, on the left, there is the co-optimized portfolio achieves a levelized cost of electricity or energy of $38 a megawatt hour. And then you can see a variety of other portfolios that have been designed essentially only with respect to one possible uh, future and then augmented perhaps to deal with a variety of other futures, ultimately leading to a higher cost of electricity and suboptimal uh, sub uh, procurements. So um, uh, again, uh, maybe I went too fast. It was a whirlwind of very technical content, but I guess what I would like for the audience to take away is that there are important consequences in not using the right planning tools and methodologies. Um, if we don't use them, we end up with systems that are more costly, less reliable, and also importantly for the conversation that we're having today, do not incorporate and do not incentivize the right technologies in the power mix, particularly long duration storage. And so what are the recommendations to uh, system planners and consultants and the important stakeholders that they start asking important and targeted questions about which tools, uh, for example, are being used, uh, the features of those tools, the abilities of those tools to capture the full variability of renewable resources, not only in a typical year on an hourly basis, but across weather years and weather conditions. Uh, and also the ability of those tools to truly look at problems such as reliability, uh, at problems such as robustness against weather events and uh, really kind of the, uh, the reality of what a grid running on mostly renewable generation will look like. Um, and so I hope, again, uh, this has been useful and that uh, this forum of uh, really deep thinkers uh, of the future of, of energy, energy transition, will take this message to various stakeholders. It's important that we act really together in changing the way grids are planned and procured for. Marco, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. and indeed uh, set the scene for our discussion today. So we have a number of uh, questions um, and uh, let me, let's have a short Q&A with you, Marco, before returning with the whole panel for a larger discussion. So Marco, can you talk a little bit about the distribution of the value of energy storage as a function of the storage duration and could you also comment on the regionality of that um, in your analysis? Yeah, uh, that, that is a great question. Um, so <clears throat> to me, it is a more of the, you know, probably the easiest way to get to the, um, to the, to the question of distribution of value across duration. So there are two parts, distribution of value across duration and then regionality of that. So uh, the best way to get to the question of distribution of value across duration is perhaps to look at equivalence in the uh, fossil fuel uh, kind of asset class. Um, we do have 
uh, pickers and we do have mid merit plans and we do have base load plans. And they had different cost structures, right? The base load plant uh, tends to have a very high fixed cost, but a very low variable cost. Intermediate plants are somewhere in between. Picker plants are more on the low fixed cost, very high variable cost, right? And in a grid that you know uh, runs primarily on a combination of renewable fuel and then some flexibility assets such as storage, you will see different classes of storage essentially serving the same functions as today pickers, intermediate plants, and baseload plants offer. Um, and so in terms of how much value is there in the picker category, say the short duration storage, or how much value is there in the long duration storage, intermediate plant and baseload category, is difficult to say. I can only say that there is value in all three buckets. Thank you, Marco. Uh, let me ask now a more technical question from your analysis. So you emphasize on the importance of the events of low and high generation mm -hmm. and how they are spread out over the whole year. Yeah. I wonder if you have analyzed the importance of the time series. So specifically, I'm asking, we could consider two distributions of events um, in terms of the sequence, right? So they all come out to the same distribution, but uh, in one case, maybe you have, you know, low generation, low generation, low generation, and another one you can mean low, high, low, high, low, and all comes out to the same in terms of the histogram, but the time series is different. The, does that That's great. And that is the reason for, the reason why it's necessary to either adopt the full chronology, to not break the chronology, maintain the chronology, or to come up with uh, time reduction techniques that somehow can preserve that chronology. Um, you know, model reduction is an important tool in the toolbox because sometimes you get to uh, problem sizes that are diff difficult to solve, per particularly if you have integer variables in there. Um, but the way we then uh, apply that time reduction uh, must be really thoughtful on not losing the chronology because you're right. If you have a sequence of very high and very low generation, you won't you know, intuitively long duration storage. If you have a sequence of high, low, high, low, high, low, maybe short duration storage is, a, is more suited. So preserving the chronology makes the whole difference. Great, Marco. Looking forward to seeing more of those results um, when you produce them. Uh, I think we just have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, there's a questions on how you model for rare events. So you talk about things varying uh, across the year, but certainly um, we're seeing gradual trends over uh, uh, 10 or so more years. And as these assets will be, um, uh, investment will be made over decades. Yeah. How do you consider these rare events and how do you value storage yeah. in these rare events? Yeah, that, that is great. Um, <laughs> that is a great question, uh, uh, Will. Um, tail events, in high renewable futures are um, consequential and are very expensive. So that's where, for example, the typical statistical approach of saying, um, you know, these events are rare, therefore are negligible, and we can go to just a typical meteorological year type of approach fail because this is the case of, yes, a tail event may be rare, may materialize only two or three times in 10 years, but when it happens, it's so costly. And so it's almost like we need to bring forward and into the industry a different way of planning for reliability. And that's the work that, for example, in, in California is starting to happen around a different definition or what reliability means in our renewable futures and how we should plan for it and procure for it. Uh, the, 
say the uh, worst possible situation um, right now, the, the, the conversation is gravitating around looking at reliability from the standpoint of the probability and cost of multi-day weather events. And that's what you should design for. You should design specifically certain assets uh, that are capable of carrying essentially reliably load during multi-day weather events. By the way, this is applicable in general in normal meteorological condition. It is even more relevant in climate change type of meteorological conditions where the extent and the, and the severity of multi-day weather events will become uh, increasingly uh, costly. Yeah, this is definitely food for thought. I'm afraid we don't have more time for questions, but we will come back and try to uh, ask more of our audience's question in the panel discussion. So Marco, thank you very much for your excellent contribution and we'll come back to you in a bit. And now I uh, hand things off to E, who will introduce the second speaker. Well, thank you, Will. Thank you, uh, Marco. Um, this is E. Che, co-director of Storage X, as well as recently uh, I took on a role as the director of uh, Preco Institute for Energy. Uh, let me welcome the next speaker, Andrew Padrati. Andrew is a uh, co-founder and CTO of uh, Energy Watt. Um, certainly before that he uh, has been served as founder and CTO of a number of technology companies before. He is the inventor of more than 25 patents worldwide for a variety of silver engineering and energy related application. Uh, Andrew has a master's degree in structural engineering. Uh, with that, I'll let the Andrew to uh, talk to us about what's going on in Energy World. Thank you, Yi, for the pleasure to present at this uh, very nice event. Sorry, Chick. So uh, I will uh, run through uh, our technology um, as um, the idea, a little bit on the ideas that uh, has been uh, the process of generating new ideas. Uh, Energy Vault is being founded by Bill Gross, myself, and our CTO, Robert Picconi, um, with the because Bill was always uh, obsessed, I would say, uh, from the fact that storage is key, is a key word today uh, to enable renewable energy. So um, uh, we started with this, uh, this in mind to explore uh, what kind of technologies are around uh, to store energy. So there are chemical, chemical technologies, so many old batteries types. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of chemistry actually possible. There's all the thermodynamic realm uh, with, uh, you know, converting heat to electricity and back with heat pumps, uh, hair liquefaction, supercritical CO2, many, many, uh, many different processes are already in development or have been developed. There are all the mechanical realm, uh, specifically the pump hydro, uh, where uh, actually pump hydro is, uh, is today the most diffused way to store electricity. And uh, that's exactly where we focus because uh, we thought that um, we should try to uh, leverage all the experience developed in pump hydro, uh, but to overcome uh, all the uh, issues about uh, the pump hydro. So try to enable this very simple uh, idea of potential energy uh, to uh, keep, to, to Capable to, to, to make it capable to install it everywhere. So without all the limitation of uh, topography that actually you cannot install pump hydro everywhere, unfortunately. And, uh, and even also to try to uh, even beat the round trip efficiency of pump hydro. And uh, so to really make something interesting and something really simple. So um, we started the process, the idea with something very, I would say very, very simple. So just to check where you are, if you just make something very, very, very stupid. So basically just a tank full of water. And obviously, if you if you do this, uh, you end up with uh, solutions that are obviously too expensive. You are not exploiting the, uh, the steel and the material properly. And uh, uh, you can optimize a little bit with tapering and, and things like that. But obviously, you end up with uh, many issues. You have uh, uh, the pressure that is changing, so you cannot use regular turbine because of the height 
is changing during charge. Uh, you, you, you have very, very bad uses of material. So we start thinking, okay, we have to come up with something much better. And uh, uh, so the first, uh, actually, I would say the first breakthrough was to uh, study a little bit the material. So uh, what's the best material to use for such an idea? And uh, it's very important that every mechanical um, storage ends up with a, a, a ratio between cost density, so uh, weight, divided by the strength. And still, it's a good material, but not the best. Concrete is much better. Concrete has a lower strength, lower density, which is good, so lower strength, which is bad, but uh, the cost is definitely uh, unbeatable. So that's why concrete actually is material construction number one in the world. And But it has uh, the issue that it's capable of only um, taking compressive load, and otherwise you need to add steel. So um, we end up with an interesting idea to basically divide uh, the pressure, uh, instead of having the full pressure on the, on the lower end, we are supporting uh, the water um, on the top end and uh, basically uh, making sort of floors. And this was uh, uh, something interesting and we start developing on that. And um, uh, the main issue was that uh, we're still using not perfect material, so we evolved a little bit uh, with combination of steel and concrete. So still in tension and concrete just in compression, but still too complex. You have too many piping, plumbing, bales, and everything it was really unmanageable. So uh, we tried to keep the same idea, but um, trying to uh, make bigger reservoir, always with the floor ideas, but keeping the same reservoirs to reduce the amount of plumbing, but still uh, we had uh, a lot of bales and things on, on each uh, trough. This was a pretty good uh, um, design uh, with this uh, membrane trough, which are working just in tension and all the compression. But uh, we evolved again and we arrived to uh, this idea, which is um, uh, actually with this idea, we, we started the company. So uh, we designed this and say, okay, uh, we can go with this because we have um, very nice uh, constant jump of height, so basically you discharge the top floor and you uh, reload basically the, the middle floor so that the differential height is always constant. So you are going down one floor and going down also one floor. So basically you keep your uh, pressure drop a constant, which is very good for pumping and turbines. Uh, you have only one valve per floor, which was also very interesting. And so we think, okay, with this, we might be able to live and, um, and so let's develop this. And we decided to start the company with this idea, basically. And then we, we realized that, okay, yes, fine, but still complex. We have uh, too much material, too much construction material for just keeping the water. So why we just just use the material itself as a storage medium? So we get rid of water and try to, uh, use directly the material. So, um, so we, we began to look in, in some detail about just pure potential mechanical energy store. So just a crane, okay, imagine just lifting a crane. Which is very interesting because converting mechanical, you don't have uh, fluids, you don't have uh, losses of uh, turbines and fluids and fluid dynamics, much less friction. Motor generators are really very efficient. You can add vibro frequency drive, you can tune the power. So it's, it's very interesting, but you cannot use only one weight unless you have a, a deep hole. I mean, if you have a thousand meters, then you, can, you could even use one eight. But otherwise your power uh, device, your lifting device or your power is, is too expensive. So we started thinking, okay, we can stack. And this was the key idea uh, of uh, energy vault. Um, because uh, you can use weights uh, and bricks. Uh, and every time you add the brick on height, these bricks has acquired potential energy. But it's also part of the structure that you can use to gain additional height and so on. So uh, every brick is used twice as a supportive structure and uh, as the medium to store energy, so the potential energy. And this turned out to be pretty interesting and uh, 
But you can see from this slide, you can, you can have a pretty high uh, average high, even with uh, not much uh, bricks. And uh, you minimize your uh, fixed bricks. So basically the bricks that you're manufacturing, but uh, basically never moves because you cannot spread out indefinitely uh, your load. Uh, interesting, you can see from the numbering, just to, as, 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 um, as a demo, you see that uh, you, you take the first brick, you have more flight time. Uh, therefore, you are putting the brick uh, further away in the, in the motion, horizontal motion. Uh, yes, but you cannot go indefinitely. So you, you, you have to stack also the, the base at, at some point. So, but this uh, was the main concept that um, uh, started to take shape in the idea generation. Uh, we explore many other, I mean, this is just a subset. This is eight idea actually, but this, I think it was the 50s ideas or even more. But uh, okay, we can take a crane and, and automate it and stack things. Uh, what you can do better to save steel? Well, you, for example, you can do something symmetric so that uh, you can have a balanced tower. You can use the bricks to, to stabilize the tower. Uh, and you need somehow to make a continuous power output uh, because uh, uh, what you do when, you, when one brick is landing, uh, you, you, you have no generation. And then you have to go, go up again and grab the next one. So, uh, and, and you want to get to give power. I mean, you need a substantial amount of power. Uh, you cannot use just regular crane that, that can store maybe uh, 50 or 100 kilowatt power, but, but, but for, for hundreds of hours. So we wanted to do, to increase the power. And so we end up with something that is now, it's the, it's the current design basically, which is um, a multi-arm crane. Okay, it's nothing special in terms of, uh, of design because it's just taking a six regular crane combined together and, uh, um, and connected. And we basically orchestrate the motion of this crane so that it can be able to deliver continuous power. So um, I'm going to show um, uh, the, the first proof of concept. So we did, uh, we did okay, let's try it, um, how to solve all the motion. Because it's pretty complex. You, can, you cannot have a guy on the ground that for each brick is, is, is helping to, uh, to locate properly uh, the, the brick. You need to be very accurate. You need to be a repeatable, should work in any weather. And there is no contact. So every twisting, every, every pendulum should be uh, uh, accommodated automatically and should be adjusted automatically. So we run some, some math and uh, we both are. Uh, a uh, very old crane, actually a second-hand crane, actually it was 40 years old. Uh, we refurbished it totally. So all the power electronics, motor, uh, hoisting, trolleys, uh, slewing, everything we replaced with our proper cabinet. We wrote our control software and we tried it. So um, basically it was summer 2018. We proved that uh, we were able to grab uh, any any barrel in that case, we just barrel because it was very simple to, to take it and manufacture. Uh, and uh, to grab the, any barrel on each location on the ground and put it on top of the tower properly without any human interaction. And additionally, we even try to, um, to even stop uh, any swinging uh, uh, occurring by, by wind or external forces or by a sudden shutdown or, or by some uh, other event. We were able even to, uh, to stop the motion, uh, even if it was weighing alone, uh, just using a camera system. So uh, with that, uh, with this, that proof of concept, the company basically uh, managed to uh, raise substantial funding and we start a very quick, very quick uh, uh, construction phase from, uh, from designing the real tower uh, and to assemble. And you can see it's, um, Pretty big uh, uh, tower crane, but it's still a tower crane. I mean, it's a it's a huge tower crane. Uh, with uh, in this case, uh, it's in our site in Switzerland, uh, where we um, have designed the foundation, temporary foundation. It's a, a out of the ground foundation. It's just ballast so that you don't have to dig out, so you can disassemble and, and sell it to a customer. And uh, we proceeded, we continued to erect this for uh, basically six months, roughly. And it took uh, with procurement, with COVID uh, taking over also was uh, really a pain. Uh, but we managed to uh, move forward. 
we have uh, all the see the cabinets and the power electronics and the white uh, cabinets uh, here are all the power electronics uh, uh, drive so inverter fiber frequency drive and mid voltage transformer and, and uh, the central g part with the the additional joint uh, to tune uh, the arm and grab different bricks at different position obviously the, the tower is symmetric but you can have some slight adjustment on each arm so um and we managed to uh, complete this, uh, this uh, construction and by putting together uh, the all each level. You can see here, uh, pretty interesting, the hoist uh, on the left and right uh, uh, of the cabinet. You see this uh, uh, gray ring is the emergency brake. So the, the emergency brake in case of power failure. For example, here you have the big wrench uh, that can take. This is a... Uh, 2.6 megawatt. So each hoist is 1.3 megawatt nominal power uh, with 1.6 uh, megawatt peak power. So basically it's a crane, but definitely way more, more powerful than a conventional crane or container crane. But in the way, it's a, it's a crane. Uh, all the drive are regenerative. Uh, we go up with mid voltage cable to the top so that cable line are, are smaller. And, uh, uh, and the cable torques so a little bit like, yeah, like on windmill uh, or plus minus 180 degree to accommodate all the, all the motion requirement. Uh, we installed the chips and so the action continued until we uh, completed uh, the construction. We did uh, also all the uh, commissioning now, it's uh, uh, almost done, so we are now, um, beginning, um, we expect to begin by mid-February the stress test. So basically continuously operating uh, the system uh, and we expect to finish it by, by March. Uh, but we developed everything uh, and uh, we added also a lot of more instrumentation that was required, especially for the first project to acquire important data uh, on the motion and uh, operating parameter forces, cable tensions and pulleys. Uh, a lot of details there are in the in the system uh, to assess and to fine tune uh, future design. <clears throat> and here is the completed uh, crane. So uh, you can see um, the brick. The brick is very important because yes, the crane is key, but more important are the bricks because the bricks are the real things that store such energy because it's the one that takes takes and releases potential energy. And is the, the, the responsible for the whole structure, actually. So the brick is very important, and I will uh, run through a short video uh, to show how it's made. So the brick is uh, really not just concrete. Actually, it's not concrete. It's, I uh, would say, it's a cement-based polymer, a uh, cement-based uh, material, uh, where basically it's made out of uh, almost anything. I mean, I would say this is... Interesting because we started thinking about concrete, but then a uh, low performance concrete, but then uh, working with Samex, our, our partner, uh, the, the well-established um, cement, a Mexican cement manufacturer, uh, they have a very interesting uh, technology to basically uh, make a sort of concrete uh, out of uh, dirt, of soil, of regular soil, uh, any kind of soil, it's sand, sea, the sand, uh, uh, you know, gravel, uh, e e even even clay, and um, that's enabled us to really excavate the material locally. Not, not, you cannot afford to transport a huge amount of material locally uh, to, to make a storage. You, you need you need to have a, uh, the, the, this material right there on site, and therefore um, uh, this enables us to do that. But more more than that, you will show in the next in the course of the presentation that can enable. Even, even additional interesting things. So let's go to shortly to the video that explain a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, the general concept. I mean, uh, the the um, uh, the working principle, which I think everyone already understood, is just is just potential energy. But the interesting is that you can see there are two hooks that are going down, and two other stars, and the other two are catching up. So basically, you are always four. A way that are uh, being moved uh, so that you have a continuous power. And, uh, and you see this is the fully discharged position and the fully charged position. So um, 
important as you see the, the brick and um, the brick are made out of dirt and uh, you have a top deck and lower deck which is regular concrete so everything is in contact and uh, it's uh, concrete it's re regular concrete precast concrete but the brick itself 95 percent of the brick is just dirt uh, we add the, we need to add some admixture, some cement, but very low amount compared to regular concrete. And we need to add fiber, some uh, glass, fiberglass, uh, to uh, increase a little bit some tensile strength. Okay, we need just compression, compressive strength, but obviously uh, you need some tensile stress either. And uh, to achieve that, we add these uh, fibers. And we squeeze everything. Basically, with a huge press, we develop a 7,000 ton press that can squeeze the material, which is very dry, and stays immediately. You, you can demold it immediately. Uh, you don't need to wait like concrete that uh, takes a few days to, to get hard before you can demold. This can be demolded immediately and then stored in a curing yard uh, to cure. But the fact that it's always squeezed and pressed, uh, uh, can be it's stable already, like like a peel that they, they just squeeze and sinter it basically, and and the top and lower deck have you seen are are made of regular concrete and precast, so they are just already hard and uh, and ready and ready to use. So this is the uh, is the process, and uh, and uh, this enables us to really uh, go from uh, uh, one idea to uh, to the market. So basically, uh, how we can better use this technology for business. And this is interesting because uh, we started with a uh, general idea, okay, storage is required. But then uh, we understood that uh, we might be able to do something more. And uh, we thought about uh, the, 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 the circular economy and, uh, and uh, yeah, next slide. And the fact that, uh, Companies and utilities are now uh, thinking of uh, recycling the materials. And then we, we landed immediately on which kind of utility has some issues and which kind of material can we use and how can we leverage our peculiar uh, technology. And uh, we turn out that um, uh, there is some interesting facts. Uh, so the first big problem is coal combustion residuals. Uh, and I'm thinking about bottom ash, not the fly ash, that there's some uh, value, market value, but some bottom ash, and, which is typically polluted. And um, we can take this material to make the bricks. And yes, this is doable. We've done it. We've done all the tests. And uh, uh, we can combine with another very interesting uh, fresh material, which is blades. And, and guess what? They're made out of fiberglass. And because we don't need very high performance, we can really use this material nicely because uh, our blocks doesn't require the quality uh, of normal construction, civil construction. So uh, we are now able to really uh, combine these ideas and, and these uh, capabilities to create blocks that really enable a circular economy. And imagine that you can install uh, a storage system right where at the commissioning coal power plant. I mean, coal power plant is transitioning, so you're phasing out and you have problems. You have a uh, residual to dispose, you have to dismantle, but you have some very nice feature. You have already the grid connection. Uh, you have the land. You have already permitting about very tall building because normally you are in the middle of nowhere. So this is a perfect match uh, to enable a really smooth transition between uh, coal and renewable, where renewable really requires uh, a lot of uh, a lot of storage, as uh, properly pointed out by Marco. So um, summarizing, I mean, uh, just to finish, uh, we have basically used uh, very established technologies, so crane industry, shipping industry, motor generator. Combined with really cool material science and software vision, which are okay, but uh, the core is really the brick and the material. And, uh, and then with this, we're really capable of uh, creating a really uh, nice storage that solves multiple problems, not only the renewable penetration, not just enabling renewable penetration, but also 
some major uh, environmental issues. I would like to conclude because uh, uh, we are proud of that June uh, 2020 has been awarded by the World Economic Forum Technology Pioneer as the only energy storage company awarded in 2020. So uh, we're very proud about that. And so I wanted to mention it again. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. This is a very, very interesting. Uh, there's a number of questions flowing in. Uh, let, let me ask my question first. Certainly this is a mechanism. Um, well, I would like to think about and uh, compare side by side with, uh, for example, battery technology like for the storage. Uh, Andrea, can you share with us, you know, you mentioned 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, this is under the assumption of, uh, you know, how many time to use per day, right? You know, how many years this will last. Can you share with us a little bit on, on that? What's the assumption behind that? Yeah, yeah basically, uh, it's, very, it's very important because assumptions are really key uh, to that. So basically, as you can imagine, our system is better suited for a uh, long duration. I mean, we developed our system for long duration, so 10, 10 hour plus. Because uh, the, the most expensive part for us is the power side, okay? So the crane and the, and the, and the lifting equipment, while the bricks are the, the, the cheapest part. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, our design started for long duration storage. As you properly mentioned, we rely on very established technology. So the duration, the lifetime of our system is well about 30 years. You have some regular maintenance, but it's very simple, uh, very simple mechanics. And you have to grease the pulleys, and so every few years you have to replace some ropes and uh, every 20 years probably you have to repaint it even. But uh, uh, all the blocks are basically concrete and, and cement based. So basically they, they last very long. And uh, uh, so yes, our assumptions are basically 35 year lifetime, one cycle per day maximum uh, and, uh, and, uh, and with uh, basically 10, 12 hours. Okay, this is the... This is our very first design. Now, actually, we are increasing the power. So uh, we are developing different products and always based on gravity, but uh, with uh, the capability to operate uh, quicker. So customers are asking now, are asking uh, more two and four hour storage. Uh, but as Marco properly pointed out, uh, we need to understand that we need longer duration storage and to further increase. So this is a problem, it's a time problem now, but in the future, we will need longer duration storage. And that's what this, is, this, this product was designed for. In the meantime, we are also tacking, uh, so uh, two hours product and, and four hours product. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so another question I also have, I see uh, an audience uh, also asked this question, right? In thinking about this break, you know, <laughs> coming out stack together, Certainly, there's a extreme, this wind, strong wind, extreme weather condition. In California, there's also potentially earthquake, right? So uh, uh, you must, you guys must have thought about this. You know, how do you uh, handle this uh, question? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So if you can uh, bring up uh, slide 43 uh, in the backup slide. Uh, I'm glad you asked this question because this is very interesting. Uh, on the wind side, I can tell you it's, uh, we solved in the, in the way that uh, we don't have the wind issue because we are disassembled the tower inside out. So basically the outer, um, the outer tower, uh, it's, the brick are taken from the outside and uh, disassembled inside, okay? So basically the, the, the tower is hollow, okay? And uh, uh, therefore every brick is screened by the wall that is outside. That way, we, basically we cancel uh, the wind issue. Even though uh, I would say that it's not a big issue, uh, at least for example in California, because the, the, the flight time is very short. I mean, the flight time of each brick is less than one minute. So uh, even at the, the maximum height. So basically it doesn't take enough time uh, to begin swaying. And in any case, we have the vision system that compensates for that. But very interesting is the seismic. This is a really cool thing because we started a project uh, with Caltech and, and Berkeley and San Diego University. Uh, to really assess. This was my first issue uh, three years ago, actually, when we started, okay, fine, we have all this structure made up of loose bricks. Uh, would this work for, for the seismic action? 
And uh, I immediately thought that this was pretty cool because a sliding, I mean, uh, the fact that you allow the, the brick to slide one on top of the other, they dissipate a huge amount of energy. And this was my conjecture, actually. And, uh, and so we went to Caltech and tried to make some modeling, some uh, lab scale tests in top left, you see the uh, one to hundred scale test at Caltech shaker table made out of basically the brick were made out of wood and metal and different uh, weight ratio and friction ratio. And then we, we went to Berkeley and installed the big one, the central picture. You see, uh, there is a small guy on top with the arrow, which is written John Harmon, who is the modeling guy. So you see the, the, the size of the people. And uh, it's, uh, it's been tested in a, a one to 20 scale, so a much bigger scale. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is that the behavior uh, can be predicted perfectly. And that's why we, will, uh, we are writing now a very important paper in the Civil Engineering Journal uh, on that uh, item because we have discovered a new uh, number, new dimensionless number, similitude number, like, like it's done in, in fluid dynamics, but for this specific kind of structure. And you can see from the video, uh, maybe we can replay it, uh, Basically, uh, um, you can try to replay it, yeah. You see that uh, this was the third earthquake, actually. You see how, how the structure moves and, and the bricks basically displace, uh, but they don't collapse. This is rich crest, okay? This is rich crest earthquake, okay? So not, not, a, not a small earthquake. And this is very interesting because this is like uh, ancient structure in Greece that they've survived 2000 years of earthquake also. Uh, and actually they behave like this and they, they, they allow the, the column to slide. And, and you know that the Greek temple has core made out of um, lead and that allows some movement, but you can see because the, uh, the, the, the columns are rotated one another. So each segment of columns is rotated. No? And that's exactly what happens also in our structure. And uh, therefore, uh, it's very safe. And what happens when you have the earthquake? Oh, this is a problem because the brick are not in the same position. So we have to disassemble the, the, the tower with the crane automatically and reassemble it properly uh, with self-centering pins and all these kinds of things that I uh, eventually show in the question session. I hope you have answered the question. Yeah, this is cool. So Andrew, I have one last question uh, then I'll, I'll circulate back to, uh, to Will. Um, so certainly, you know, from this concrete, this lifetime, you know, 30 years, 35 years, it's all, it's all good. Uh, now you have this brick, right? Because you are moving, you're stacking. And once you stack, put it, put it on, I mean, there will be some, what small, this stacking, I, I, would, if you, I would describe this as a collision a little bit, right? But this whole thing, one day, per, uh, uh, one, one cycle per day, Right. So would you expect even the bricks could, uh, particularly making it out of soil, and I mean, concrete probably lasts for a long time, but for the soil, you compress it. Is there any concern of during these 30 years, right, when you stack this together and the different weather conditions, this rain, and, and this type of soil pressing together, would, would that last that, uh, so long? You know, we're talking about 30 years, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, exactly why we have um, this uh, top and lower deck uh, of the concrete. Basically, uh, you've seen from the picture and the video, basically we have a precasted regular concrete, so good quality concrete deck on top and on the lower part of the, yeah. uh, of the brick. So this is got, what got in contact, okay? So all the impact is very low speed impact, obviously it's just 50 millimeters per second, but basically you have some impact, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and this is just concrete. So this is where, you know, it's actually reinforced concrete. Uh, one of the rest of the, of the brick uh, is just subject to uh, weathering. And this is a great job done by CMAX. Is they developed this uh, technique to develop uh, roads in developing countries. So to make roads in developing countries without transporting too much material. So this technique uh, has been already out there since I think uh, I think more than eight, nine years now. And they have a, a lot of uh, historical data. Naturally roads are even much worse and, and, and heavily uh, weathered compared to our bricks actually. 
and, uh, and therefore they are uh, confident that this material is very durable. And because of this uh, 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 test and live test on, on, on real environment. And consider also this, that um, we are speaking about polymer technology and things, but actually the material is uh, cement. The polymer and the, this uh, additive enables the cement to make a good matrix even with dirt. Uh, and enable uh, the, the tiny uh, material to roll nicely and, and you can squeeze it. Actually, you can achieve the density of our brick, which is twice the one of the water. So it's not as good as concrete, just 2.4, but still very much higher than loose material, which is less than 1.5. So, um, and uh, uh, with this, uh, with the combination effect also of the fact that the polymer are uh, water hydrophobic, uh, there is no uh, uh, water that's going into the brick, and, and therefore there is no icing, the icing, and all these kind of things. Actually, you can see you can see from from the first picture of my deck with, in Switzerland, we have the snow now, so we, <laughs> all the bricks are outside in the snow, and so uh, this is this is very interesting. But in any case, uh, we have all the data for uh, um, accelerated uh, accelerated aging and uh, uh, icing, the icing, thermal cycles and UV radiation, but again, UV degrades polymer, but uh, the binding effect is always mineral, so it's always a cement matrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Uh, I'll circle it back to Will. Thank you so much, Andrea. We'll bring you back in the panel discussion, okay? Thank you. Well, let me add my thanks um, to Andrea as well. I really appreciate seeing the ideation process. It's always, Good to see how, how the idea came about. So our final speaker for today uh, is a veteran in energy. Yorick Kahneman is currently the CEO of Intervenue right here in Silicon Valley. And he started working in ClinTech uh, when the term was coined uh, nearly 20 years ago uh, as a partner in Accenture. Uh, in a managing consulting firm. Then he moved on to various positions, uh, leading efforts at SunPower, Primus Power, where he was the chief uh, operating officer, and now at Intervenue. So Jorg, we're very excited to hear about Intervenue, of course, and look forward to the discussion with you at the end of your talk. Jorg. Sorry. Great. Thanks very much, Will. Thank you for having me. And uh, very interesting presentations that preceded me. Um, I'm going to begin, I, I think, um, with our view of the market. And I believe that you'll find it ties together some of what we heard quite well in the earlier uh, presentations. And then I'll present what we're doing. And, and I believe you'll find that complementary as well to some of the other solutions. So, um, uh, You've, you've likely seen charts like this as we think about what's happening with the energy mix and the transformation to renewable energy over the coming decades. And generally the analyst consensus is that roughly by mid-century, we are poised to be over 75% renewable. That's a pretty broad consensus amongst the folks looking at this. So 56% roughly solar and wind, uh, and then uh, add nuclear and hydro, and then fossil fuels diminishes substantially. Um, if we look under the covers of this, we actually see a number of countries, notably China, who have announced plans to exceed this pace rather dramatically. China wants to reach 60% renewable by 2030, so just 10 years from now. Uh, I believe they'll overachieve, and I think others will as well. That leads to a tremendous demand for energy storage. And this is a chart that Bloomberg does every year. Uh, it always looks like where we are today, despite all the growth that we've seen in the past few years, is just almost infinitesimally small relative to the market opportunity ahead. And then the, the chart always seems to go up and to the right, but the magnitude each year they publish it uh, increases significantly. So this actually year on year from the last time they published it to today, nearly doubled the total addressable market here in terms of the expected number of batteries that are coming on the grid. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity for batteries and this is all types, this is uh, stationary as well as, uh, as mobile. Um, but then let's, let's take a look at 
how our electric power grid is transforming. And I thought Marco did a very nice job of, of in-depth modeling of this. If we take a step back and think about what's happening, the electric power industry as we know it, it's over a hundred years old and it's operated in essentially the same way for that period of time. Central station generation, pushing electrons then over a transmission and distribution network to a point of variable load. Um, and it, that's a pretty remarkable when you think about it because that supply chain, if you will, the value chain from generation through consumption of the power has no inventory in it. So there's no reservoirs, there's no battery, there's no storage. And somehow we have to balance the dispatchable or block oriented generation with the variability of the load and that's done through a sophisticated forward planning mechanism and then basically a little bit of frequency regulation to you know, provide a tiny bit of inventory in that supply chain. Um, and it's complicated, it's been highly regulated and we, we frankly take it for granted. It's a, it's a remarkable service that we're all the beneficiaries of. Uh, and we're used to it and our economies around the world rely on it. Now let's introduce the the variability and the complexity of renewables into that mix. And what we see is we see generation changing. So we're introducing intermittent generation, mostly through solar and wind. Uh, we're increasing the variability of load because actually at that end, we're seeing solar panels come on at the point of use, whether that's homes or businesses and so on. Uh, we're increasing our electricity consumption through electric vehicles and because it's overall cleaner, especially if you generate with renewables. Um, and then we're seeing deregulation enter so that the basically the generation, the transmission distribution and the, the consumption of power are, uh, are more variable. I can buy my power in most parts of the world. I can buy it from a variety of sources, which adds to congestion across the, the electric grid. Uh, so most of the, the people associated with industry who are tasked with keeping the grid stable look at renewables as adding a huge amount of complexity and a lot of challenge. Um, now, what, what I'm convinced is if we add, you know, add all the things together, we are looking at the very beginning, still today, of what will probably be the single biggest transformation of any form of our economy in our lifetimes. Um, and, uh, and it's going to turn this model, the, the grid as we knew it, the central station generation pushed across power lines to variable load, completely on its head. And, and I think we're not sure where there's a lot of folks who are guessing, trying to figure out how, okay, how, how is this going to work? What are the implications? Um, as we look at, at batteries, um, here's what I think is going to happen. Now, we've seen an evolution back about a decade ago. Uh, renewables were just beginning to become credible, at least they were perceived as maybe in the future without subsidies, uh, solar could be economically viable when likely sooner than that. Uh, batteries were essentially unaffordable. And then as recently as three years ago, there was still a huge amount of focus just on the super expensive batteries and how can we profit from the most beneficial short duration, say one to two hours of, of benefit, of economic benefit from adding storage to really anywhere along that value chain that I showed on the previous pages. Um, and those use cases have gradually expanded, but it was, you know, really, you know, it was as, as late as the beginning of 2018 that people were still asking, well, what, what am I going to do with a bigger battery? I, I you know, boy, how, how would I, what would I do with a battery that lasts five hours? Now that, that thinking has evolved, the battery prices have come down, different technologies, mostly lithium ion based, fueled by the large volume of electric vehicle capacity that's come on board. And so today, or last, last year, the traditional use case is now expanding to roughly four to six hours. And there's a lot of contemplation around how longer duration storage, 10 plus hours, even weekly, even seasonal, would enter into the mix. Um, most of that thinking is uh, focused on the current view or the legacy view of the grid where the generation side is viewed as uh, blocks of power, dispatchable blocks of power. Oh, I need peak capacity for four hours. I need it for six hours and then I'm gonna ramp it back down. Now in this world where we add batteries all up and down the energy value chain, 
we have them at the point of generation, we have them across the distribution network, and then we have them at the point of use through dispatchable generation and then batteries. Um, what we believe will happen is our grid becomes distributed. The grid gets turned upside down. It looks fundamentally different. We now, I don't know if anybody can accurately predict exactly what it's gonna look like 10, 20, 30 years from now, but it'll be different. And what we believe will be necessary, at least as a part of this equation, are batteries that behave very similar to the way we become accustomed to our cell phones and our power drills and our, our electric vehicles where they can be charged pretty quickly when there's excess power available. So I think charge within an hour to two to maybe four hours when I have a solar window or excess wind capacity, et cetera. And then let me discharge that battery as quickly or as slowly as as the market needs, as the particular node where I happen to have my battery, whether that's you know next to my home or somewhere on the, the distribution network or parked right next to a solar farm. So net net is we like a battery to be super flexible. Um, however, we'd also like it to be incredibly long lasting. And today's batteries, as we're all familiar with from our cell phones, the lithium ion ones, they do tend to wear out. Um, and, uh, and they actually wear out rather quickly when you consider the lifetime of power generating assets and so forth. So that's what's happening at a, you know, at a macro level. If we then take a look at uh, the economics of uh, companies that are trying to solve this problem by uh, creating solar plants, solar power plants like my team was doing in my past company, um, and then pairing them with batteries, uh, generally speaking, the economics of a grid scale solar plant are roughly one third is the capital expenditure. That's the cost of the solar panels, the trackers, the inverters, and then the batteries, all the equipment, the development costs, everything that's required to actually build the plant initially and get it up and running. Then a third, a surprisingly large percentage of the levelized cost of the energy that comes out of the plant is the operating expense, the maintenance, the cost that you need to keep the plant up and running over its duration, whether that's 10, 20, 30 years, what have you. And then the remaining third, also surprising to many people, is, is the cost of money, the, the cost of the debt and the equity that's used to finance the construction and the operation of that plant. So a net levelized cost from a plant that looks like the picture here, solar plus a bunch of batteries is, you know, typically around the world in the three to eight cents per kilowatt hour range and trending downward. Now, one of the key challenges is, all right, the more I can trim my operating expense, the more economical this becomes, the lower that levelized cost of energy becomes. In addition, we have the challenge of many, if not most of these plants tend to be in sunny locations. Many are located in deserts that see a very high temperature. You know, temperatures are range, you know, reaching the 45 degree or more Celsius range easily in the summertime, and then also dropping down quite low. And then there's restrictions on our, we know, we know today generally what we like and how we'd like to use this power, but we're not sure about the future. What if I wanna cycle the battery instead of once per day to shift my, you know, my dispatchability of the energy from daytime hours to nighttime, but what if I wanna run it twice a day or I wanna do a, a buy low, sell high for using wind in, in off hours? Uh, I like the ability to do that. And then of course there's a safety concern and also recyclability. So keeping all those things in mind, we took a look at available technologies and certainly there has been a lot of improvements in lithium ion batteries over the years, um, but it's, you know, candidly in the grand scheme of things, it's been pretty slow and, you know, we expect advances to continue, but it, you know, today we're at roughly 10 year life for one cycle a day for a lithium ion battery, that'll improve. So we, we looked at, well, what can we do? What's out there that is perhaps significantly longer, more robust in duration? And it turns out there's a technology that has a demonstrated track record of over 30,000 cycles, which is three cycles a day uh, times 30 years with essentially no usage restrictions. That's also very flexible and has similar power characteristics uh, to lithium ion. Um, and that technology is called uh, nickel hydrogen and it's been in use in outer space applications since the late 1980s and early, early 1990s. It was originally conceived for aerospace applications, specifically for satellites and things like the International Space Station, the Hubble Space Telescope, 
where there was a need back, and this is back in the days, basically before lithium ion came along, and they needed a battery that could be put into outer space and do basically a solar plus storage renewable integration to power these satellites and things. Uh, and it had to be something that required no maintenance. So it had to last forever, be very flexible, and be a you know install and forget type battery. Um, that's super cool. However, it was also ridiculously expensive and, and so expensive that back 10 years or more ago when I got into renewables and a lot of battery companies began to form to tackle, but what do you do with solar? What do you do with wind when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing problem? It was just, this technology was ignored. Uh, and, and it wasn't until uh, Professor Shui at Stanford and his team took a closer look at it and thought, you know, I think we can do this with lower cost materials and then we've since built on those materials and re-engineered this type of battery for large-scale manufacturing. So we now have a, um, a highly competitive metal hydrogen battery that is durable, safe, flexible, absolutely zero maintenance. This is install and forget. You don't have to touch the thing. Uh, it's a, a very affordable and it's based on this proven technology that has been in, successfully in operation for, for 30 years continuously in these aerospace applications. On the right-hand side, you'll see a version of an early prototype. These are over a year old. It's, it's basically a, a sealed cylinder with a stack of electrodes inside it. Uh, and at the top are terminals, you connect the batteries and there's a, a far more elegant design that we have now that I'm not able to show you publicly, uh, but it's a incredibly simple device, very easy to put together, very easy to take apart. Uh, for future recyclability at the, at the end of its life cycle, for example. Um, and it has uh, a, a number of characteristics that are really exciting and make it super versatile in the battery world. Um, for starters, it, it operates in a very broad temperature range, uh, minus 40 to plus 60 degrees Celsius. Now, you may be wondering if you've looked at the tear sheet for a lithium ion battery, they'll give you a similar range. The difference is that you know that battery range is based on having air conditioning and other a lot of complex systems to keep the battery happy at, at an internal operating temperature or room temperature. Our chemistry allows us to be happy and comfortable across that broad temperature range. So we actually are just as happy in high desert temperatures as we are at room temperature as we are as if things approach freezing. Um, and then it's super durable with excellent overcharge capability. So it's kind of self-correcting and a much simpler battery to control. There's no fire risk, no thermal risk. Uh, it's very flexible in terms of the speed rate, the rate at which you can pump energy into it. You can charge it as fast as a 5C. Think of that as charging the entire battery in 12 minutes. Uh, or you could just, you know, charge or discharge at a trickle charge very slowly, very fast, which gives, when co combined with the, you know, endless cycle life or 30,000 cycle lives, it gives the customer a future-proof solution. So if I build a, a battery storage system right now, anticipating one cycle a day, and then I choose because the environment changes, because our grid is shifting and who knows, decide I need to cycle three times a day, I can do it, no additional cost, and there's, and there's really no problem with it. Um, uh, true no maintenance, affordable, we're using far lower cost materials. So we believe we will be able to continually meet the ever, ever declining capital cost of lithium ion batteries. And then we over deliver with significant additional value for these stationary use cases. Uh, and that maintenance cost I'll show you in a moment translates to very significant economic savings. Uh, so for example, um, if, we, if we model what we're seeing develop now around the world, a fairly standard 24 by seven solar plant, 24 by seven implies I'm using solar during the day to you know, push into the grid. I'm using excess solar to charge my battery. And then I'm dispatching that in the, the evening, nighttime, and early morning hours when the sun's not shining to essentially create a more or less 24 by seven power plant using renewable solar, in this case, married with the battery. The economics of that plant that are, <clears throat> that are shown here um, for roughly 120 megawatts peak of solar and a battery that would store 300 megawatt hours are a levelized cost of energy um, of roughly five and a half cents per kilowatt hour. That's the whole plant, solar and the storage, 
for lithium ion. And then if we hold the assumptions the same and just sw simply swap in an inner venue battery using our technology, there's a significant levelized cost savings of nearly 20% in a use case where we cycle it, that battery once a day. If we isolate just the battery piece of it, again, this is the same, same assumptions, same capital cost, you know, no maintenance cost essentially on the battery, that economic advantage just for the storage portion um, is over 40%. So it's quite substantial. This, this gets the attention of anyone building these plants who are looking at the internal retain, rate of return on the project. And you can see it jumps from 4.4 to 7.4%. That, you know, that gets an investor's attention. Now let's take that same project and say, what if in the future, the, the pr power plant owner decides they want to cycle the battery or they have to cycle the battery twice a day instead of once a day? you can see the economics get, you know, it's more than doubles on the internal rate of return. The levelized cost of energy advantage jumps to 24%, and then just the storage piece is in the 60% range. Um, same thing holds true for a pure grid scale storage application. This is one where it isolates just the batteries connected next to the grid, really anywhere on the grid, and then essentially buy it power at a high price, uh, sorry, at a low price when there's excess energy available, sell it at peak times when the pricing is high, do that twice a day. And you'll see because of the, the amount of times the battery gets used, the replacement cost and so forth, that that zero maintenance charge that, that you know, install and forget capability has a significant advantage, 58% in this case. Um, and then if we decide, well, we're gonna, instead of twice a day, we're gonna cycle it three times a day, that advantage jumps and it's you know, into a range where it's now three times the economic return um, of what would be a, uh, you know, a, a traditional or a, a rapidly declining price lithium ion uh, storage solution, which is predominant in the market today. Um, the, um, and that, that same, same math works at a smaller scale too. That could be residential, it could be small commercial, or it could be things like remote applications where we're seeing telecom towers powered by remote solar plus batteries installed by the thousands, if not the tens of thousands around the world. These tend to be in hard to reach locations. Often there's very few roads to get there, et cetera. And the cost of the maintenance role, basically the truck role, to go do something like check on the battery pack or replace it or augment it or so forth over the life of this asset is very expensive, likely understated by the modeling that we've done here. So this, this shows a 37% advantage for the, uh, the cost of storage. It's probably far more than that if you really were to put a, an appropriate price tag on the value of never having to maintain this or having batteries that last as long as the actual solar panels do. Uh, and as the power electronics equipment in the, the telco tower does. Um, so it, since we have an, a largely academic audience, um, we, uh, we had to include a little bit more about how our battery works. Um, this is a, a simplified version of it. Again, uh, for those that are interested, we can you know, get you under the tent and show you a little bit more uh, an actual real drawing, but think of it as a, a cylinder, a canister. Uh, that's roughly two liters in volume. Within that is an electrode stack. And there's basically, we have a cathode and an anode and we're building hydrogen as we charge inside the canister. And then the reverse happens as we discharge. Um, that's a very stable reaction. It's very simple. The materials are earth abundant. They're easily found. It's incredibly durable and it's incredibly resilient. And it allows us to create this basically battery pack uh, that's quite versatile. Again, performance characteristics similar to the, uh, the flexibility that we're accustomed to for lithium ion, uh, but in a far more durable um, way and, and in a way that requires no maintenance. Um, and that gives us the capability to match the market. And we, the, the market tends to be quite sensitive to the capital cost, the initial outlay of what does it cost to build a plant uh, we believe we'll comfortably be able to match the continued rapid decline of lithium ion batteries as those volumes increase, um, yet offer these types of stationary energy storage systems the benefit of the extreme durability, whether that's climate or just number of cycles, the flexibility to use them however you want to in a true install and forget zero maintenance mode that's also safe and also designed from the beginning to be recyclable because it is so elegantly simple. 
and that economic benefit is you know manifests to 20 to 40 percent or more depending on the use case uh, so it's a uh, it's a very very exciting technology um, what we've uh, what we've done it over the last six months is we've run through a number of different design iterations and we have resolved the technical risk. Uh, we had set ourselves uh, set for ourselves a spec based on uh, modeling that we did on where we believed we needed to be relative to uh, what customers would require in terms of battery capacity per unit volume, in terms of energy efficiency, um, in terms of the thermal capability, for example, where the, I call it the happy temperature that our battery operates at. And what we're finding, it, it been, in, as we introduce these new materials, we wanted to make sure we would hit that spec. Uh, what we're finding is that we are already, even in very small volumes, far exceeding the threshold that we needed to be at to be market relevant um, to the point where we are absolutely convinced this chemistry works. Uh, the materials that we're using, they absolutely work. And we're, we have the benefit of 30 years of proof that the battery as a concept works um, now tuned with our materials. We thought we would see a reduction in performance with lower cost materials. What we've actually found is the material innovation gives us not only lower cost, but actually significantly higher performance. So we're performing at a level we thought we would be at two years from now at far higher volumes, for example. Um, and, and what that's doing is basically putting us in a launch pad where we now have a, a rocket ship like trajectory planned to scale up very, very quickly based on you know, the proof that the technology works uh, and, and get to very large volumes very quickly uh, through, um, uh, I'll say, you know, through, through strategic partnerships, through, through our strategic investors. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very, very exciting. Um, and uh, I think it's complementary to what we're doing is complementary to other forms of storage. The energy storage world is not a one size fits all. There's different use cases with different batteries that and storage mechanisms that will meet different parts of the value chain. Ours is one that happens to be very, very flexible uh, and uh, very long lasting and durable and well suited for nearly any stationary application, big or small around the world. Jorg, thank you very much for sharing your technology with us. Very exciting. So um, we have time just for a few questions before we jump into the panel discussion. Can you speak about the maintenance cost of a lithium ion battery? I know that we've been seeing more and more large deployments. Um, you know, for example, um, the lithium ion battery system, 800 megawatt hour um, in uh, Moss Landing, just uh, in our backyard. Uh, can you give us some an idea uh, of what that looks like right now for lithium ion batteries? Yeah, it's a, so typically for lithium ion batteries, what a customer will do, a customer being someone who's building one of these power plants, such as the one at Moss Landing, they will model in the lifespan of the, of the lithium ion battery. Let's say for sake of argument, that's typically 3000 cycles, 10 years roughly, may extend over time. And then they'll they'll model in a replacement of that battery, of just the battery pack portion, and they'll assume in the economics that the price is going to continue to decline. And we've modeled in those same assumptions in our comparison. Um, and then there's also typically an annual maintenance charge that can be between one, as low as 1%, generally it's more like 2% of the original purchase price, which covers warranty and other stuff that might happen. Uh, so that those numbers add up, you know, they don't sound like much when you think, okay, I'm building this big plant, but as it turns out that that ends up being roughly one third of the levelized cost of energy of one of these plants. And the same is true on the solar side. So as, as we look at how to be competitive and the power plant business is extraordinarily competitive, every nickel matters across that value chain. So anywhere there's an economic advantage that says, okay, I can take my maintenance cost down, uh, whether I'm you know, whether I'm planning on augmenting the battery later or I've oversized or whatever, if I can get rid of that, it goes straight to the bottom line and results in lower wholesale power prices and ultimately lower retail prices for the end consumer. And Jorg, am I correct to assume that flow battery would have much higher maintenance costs than lithium ion batteries? Uh, yeah, they, I mean, a flow battery, you've got a number of, of challenges. Typically there's membranes or filters that have to be replaced. There's plumbing. There's a, there's a lot of complexity there that, you know, it requires maintenance. Um, the lithium ion batteries, they've had a head start and they've actually done a very good job of 
you know, of putting the systems in place necessary to keep those batteries happy and so on. They're really sophisticated, but they, you know, they do require maintenance. Um, and uh, they are more fragile inherently just based on the chemistry. York, there was a question on the um, energy density of your technology. Are you able to comment on the, um, the cell level energy density? Yeah, it's, you know, it's surprisingly good. Uh, I, so I, I came in thinking, all right, if we can hit 4x the volume, meaning that we're going to be four times the volume per unit of energy of lithium ion, then for stationary applications where density is less important, we'd have a winning solution. Turns out the modeling we're doing has, a, based on the you know, the performance characteristics, the capacity has us closer to 2x, mm -hmm. meaning net volume. After you consider not just the battery pack, but the full system, we don't need fire suppression. We don't need air conditioning. We don't need, you know, a lot of spacing between the units. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically just uh, giant racks of those cylinders. Uh, it's about a 2x volume. It's heavier. So you, you would not want to tow this around in your car, for example, or you know, put it in your purse to power your cell phone. Um, but it's a very, very manageable volume form factor for stationary applications. And Yorick, is that 2X at the systems level or? Correct, at systems level. Okay, so that's uh, sort of balancing between the um, decreased need for various overheads in the Yeah, th that's right. And there's probably opportunity in there as well because we can pack more of these together. There's less of a setback requirement. You don't have a, a fire safety issue and, and some other things, but. It's, it's very competitive. 4X would have, I think the math would have worked just fine. We're closer to 2X. That's a very happy zone. Excellent. There's one specific question um, from our audience. Uh, what is the discount rate used in your financial simulations? Uh, I think we used 8% in this. And it's same, same. So there's, there's also a, you know, a declining assumption for the price of lithium ion battery packs for the augmentation that's assumed in. You can model this however you want. You end up with basically the same net effect. Take, reduce that maintenance cost and it's a massive uh, influencer on the overall economics of the, the plant. Excellent, York. Thanks again. And let me now invite everyone to return um, to the stage. Excellent. Uh, e, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to ask, uh, well, first of all, thank, thank you, three of you. Um, about the scaling issue, if I look at the electricity consumption just now, right, we are talking about 2.5, you know, close to three terawatt power. And uh, if I do a simple conversion, I say this, this is worldwide consumption. I do a simple conversion as I want to store for four hours, right? That already translate into, you know, by 2050, we probably need 10 terawatt hour, might be even more, right? Long duration would even more. So we're talking about 10, 20 terawatt hour of storage or more. I want you to comment on the scaling issues. How, how do we get there, right? You, can we get there? Uh, uh, I mean, this is very exciting opportunity, of course, for, for storage. You can see the market is big, but, but the challenging is their scalability. Um, I don't know, Andrew, do you want to start? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting uh, question because uh, the, exactly as Mark pointed out, we need to start now because you cannot uh, uh, just show up uh, with a terawatt hour capacity in one year. I mean, it takes, takes, takes long time. Uh, for our technologies, we leverage a trillion uh, business already established, so construction companies, steel manufacturing, uh, uh, motor generator manufacturer, but still, it would take a long time to reach that, uh, that amount of capacity. I mean, uh, many, many years, I mean, many decades, actually, because uh, it, it's in any case a big, big process. Uh, if, you compute, if you compute the numbers behind that and the cost, even take very competitive numbers, you know, even, even taking $30 per kilowatt hour, even very low number, you end up with trillions. Uh, and therefore you cannot just pop it up in, in, in one night. So uh, this is very important. I think people should be aware of that and we need to begin quickly. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the things that we look at and, and what it takes to scale up, and I think the world has demonstrated it's very good at scaling up quickly when there's economic benefit. We look at the manufacturing tooling costs. So how, how much tooling CapEx will we need per gigawatt hour of capacity? 
and uh, we believe we're at roughly 20% of the tooling cost relative to the equivalent lithium ion battery plant capability, just based on the simplicity of it's easier. You don't need, you know, clean rooms. It's, there's a whole, you know, a whole lot less complexity involved in the manufacturing process. Ours is more a simple assembly. So there's, there's less CapEx and that increases the ability to put volume on very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with uh, Andrea and Jorg. Uh, it's the, the material cost needs to be extremely low, materials very abundant. Uh, the tooling cost uh, to scale needs to be very low. And so leveraging well-established uh, manufacturing techniques and approaches that are already at scale and essentially must boil down to a supply chain, honestly, a supply chain and execution cost. So establishing supply chains with suppliers that already exist, uh, logistics, execution cost, and, and that allows you to essentially incrementally scale, like Andrea was saying, over time, and initially, of course, support and incentives to really kind of really see that process. But intrinsically, you need to have economies of scale uh, built in from the onset. Yeah, I mean, it also speaking of scaling, this couple together with um, really favor with the long lifetime batteries, right? Also other storage mechanism, you know, like, uh, you know, gravity. Uh, otherwise, you, you build up something, you know, every seven, eight years, you need, to you need to change it. I mean, this doesn't help your scaling uh, unless you figure out very simple process of uh, recycling, circular economy. You know, certainly this point, if anybody wants to make a comment, you know, you know please do, yeah, about this long lifetime, uh, it's, it's important. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the long lifetime, I think, was one of our uh, key aspects. I mean, uh, leveraging existing industries, leveraging existing, these existing technologies, uh, leveraging existing uh, infrastructure. We don't need much tooling, you know, because it's just a construction process. We need the, just a, what we call the brake machine, the press. I mean, this is a little bit custom but it's insignificant compared uh, to battery technology, to lithium ion technology that they require gigafactories, require really sophisticated equipment that they need to scale. So, um, and therefore I think uh, this is, therefore pump hydro, for example, uh, was very, very successful in the past because this technology lasts for 60 years. So you don't need to replace mm -hmm. anything. You need to just, just run and improve, improve incremental, incremental capacity. Well, back to you. Thanks, Iya. I thought I would uh, maybe build off that question a little bit and talk about the sustainability issues. And Andrea, I appreciate you covering this uh, in your talk. So I thought I would maybe present the question in the following way. You know, many of our listeners are working in the lithium ion battery field. And when you compare say long duration storage of any kind, uh, uh, typically you think of it as lower energy density in, in, in some cases, in many cases. And also over the lifetime of the technology, perhaps also slightly lower energy throughput, which both of these I think puts more pressure on the sustainability aspect. Um, maybe you can talk about how sustainability um, has uh, formed your thinking, right? I think all of you touch upon this a little bit, but maybe Andre, you can expand upon a little bit more how you are mitigating um, these challenges, um, please. Yeah, the sustainability is very, is very key, uh, especially we have two uh, main focus there. Uh, one is the carbon footprint, actually, this is also important because when you speak about cement, you, you immediately uh, think, oh, carbon intensity. So, um, uh, we are trying to really reduce the amount of cement in our bricks. So we, we are less than one third of regular concrete bricks, uh, regular concrete construction. And, uh, and we're trying to further reduce uh, with the new generation products to offset this uh, CO2 environment. We are approaching also different technology to uh, uh, use carbon negative aggregates, uh, like the aggregates developed by, by Blue Planet, uh, or other, other methodologies to uh, reduce the carbon. From the environmental aspect, actually, as, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, uh, we are trying to, to help, I mean, try to solve uh, an old problem in energy generation. So the coal combustion residual disposal, 
And I think I think there we are fairly fairly unbeatable in this uh, in this topic because I think we are the only one energy solution that could use such a, such material and try to integrate. Um, on the on the recyclability, uh, as mentioned, you know uh, we are using construction materials, so at the end of life of our system, uh, you can refurbish it and you can extend life as done by by a conventional power plant, or you can dispose it. Dispose means uh, you can recycle all the steel, all the metals, uh, all the copper. You have some plastic things that cables, such such things that you cannot will be easily recycled. Maybe yes, in the future. And, and the bricks and the bricks are a big quantity of material that are actually soil, uh, and uh, and you can use it again for uh, uh, landscaping, for example uh, roads. Uh, or uh, um, you know landscaping uh, purposes, uh, and we are working now with architects to really uh, focus on in a very very long future and uh, how to uh, accommodate such uh, such uh, you know uh, end of life uh, design already in, in 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 the project phase. Already now for the next thirty years, how we can vision and you know, view the future landscape of the site and try to reuse as much as possible from our from our bricks. Yeah, if, if I could add to that, the the power industry, the electric power industry tends to be heavily economic driven. And so the people who are investing in solar power plants today are the same ones who built gas plants and coal plants before that. They're doing it 99% out of economic motivation to make money. So the key to saying sustainability is making it profitable to you know put in place the most sustainable solution. And I think we're at a point where that's working nicely in that generally the lower cost materials, the simpler solutions, they have a lower overall cost and they happen to be sustainable. And then there's actually a component of these plants where the, the decommissioning that Andrea mentioned, so when you know, it's required for most power plants in most parts of the world to include in the economics of the plant, the takedown of that plant at the end of its useful life. So you can actually quantify what that costs. Um, and then I think in addition to that, we're going to see government doing its job and actually requiring recyclability and cradle to cradle thinking and so forth. But it, really, that has to be introduced from the outside. That's not a natural thing. That's something that a power plant owner will react to when forced. But it's going to happen. So it's going to push us all towards more sustainable solutions. So for maybe for the time consideration, let me just ask uh, one last question. Um, it's... Um, well, we have a lot of students uh, in the audience right here. You three of you have been certainly, you know, through the, uh, the clean energy, uh, this area for a long time. Do you have advice for the students? Yeah, to use, um, just about maybe one minute otherwise, then we'll, we'll end today's conversation you know, to, to the students, uh, what to do, how to think about, you know, how to explore the next step, yeah. He actually, if I can also broaden the question, I think we also have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs um, in the audience as well. So since yeah. we have <laughs> serial entrepreneurs here, maybe also uh, advice to them will be very useful. The, uh, I'll give you two. First is, uh, I, I do believe we are at the beginning of the, the single biggest transformation we're gonna see in our lifetime, as big or bigger than the internet. Uh, it, the, just the change that's going to happen, turning the electric grid and the power industry as we know it upside down, there is opportunity all up and down that value chain. Uh, so it, it's worth a close look. Very specifically, we are hiring, we're hiring a lot at entervenue.com. Come check us out. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, there is no one technology, you know, it isn't the power industry in the past. You don't have one generation system. You have from nuclear to hydro coal to gas to whatever you want so i think there is no one technology and either in the storage there will be no one technology and especially for a mobile application for a stationary application long duration short duration at the end of the day there will be a mix of technologies and opportunities so i think there is plenty of opportunity to further explore different technologies to try to overcome the current limitation of of uh, of existing technology so for example for vehicle you need to uh, increase uh, the energy density. For flying vehicle, you need to increase furthermore the energy density. This is one very interesting research topic. Uh, on the other side, uh, for the stationary storage, where the weight is correctly pointed by York is not, not so relevant, you need to 
cut the cost because it's economically driven. It's again, other technology, other chemistries. I think there's plenty of space and we were just uh, seeing the beginning of, of this evolution. Um, this, this is great. Um, thank you, Andrea Jorg, very inspiring. Uh, you know, this is my third venture in clean tech. The first one was a disaster. The second one was a bit better and this one we'll see. Uh, I can tell you it's, it's tough, right? The energy space is tough because the challenges are huge and really consequential. So if you're the kind of person that loves big challenges and trust really transformational work, uh, clean energy is your thing. Uh, you know, join us or start your company, uh, but whatever, uh, don't lose faith. Um, and this is a long-term game as well. So, you know, I'll take, I'll take several years to build one of these truly transformational companies, but it'll be worth it. Marco, thank you very much. On, on, on that note, um, I think we are witnessing the energy transitions as it happens. And uh, it's so delightful uh, for us to hear from three pioneers uh, who are doing this uh, on the very front line of this. So thank you very much for your efforts. And we hope to follow the progress of your companies uh, in the coming years. Um, so this closes today's session. And uh, Justin, if I can have the slide. So two weeks from now, we're going to have another very interesting discussion, uh, again, with two industry leaders, uh, Simon Morris and Adam uh, Panayi, who are uh, running two really successful analysis company uh, looking at uh, energy storage uh, supply chains across the board. So we're going to get a very high level overview of how the market is doing and specifically how we are addressing um, the need of scaling up uh, from a supply chain perspective. So I welcome everyone to return two weeks from now, same time. And again, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for listening in. Andrea, Marco, and Yorick, thank you for your contribution today. And uh, we'll see everyone later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.